Joe Diamidi, TTRP TV, sitting in the back of the Grand Jet, uh, where Paul has just gave us a nice of uh, recounting stories, African stories mostly. And he's a storyteller from England. And like happens here in the Grand Jet, people pass by and they get drawn to the place. And we've had some from folk singers to, to groups of music. We've had a lot of good stuff here. And tonight was a really nice, a different night of storytelling. And that's Paul playing his lovely African instrument. And what's the name of that instrument, Paul? It's called a Kora. Kora. With a K. Kora with a K. Yeah, this is uh, from Mali. I have one at home in England, which is from Senegal. So each one is different. Each has its own sound. Uh, mine at home has 21 strings. This one has 22 strings. And uh, they have this kind of ambience. Relaxed ambience, really good for storytelling. Yes, it's, I mean, it was nice because sometimes you did play it as you were telling the stories yeah. and sometimes you didn't. It's yeah. quite nice to, to blend the two sometimes. Uh, with the Cora, I quite often will set the scene when people are still coming in and be playing the Cora. I, I kind of like that. So they come in, they settle down, and at some point I feel the room's ready, and then we... Oh, yes, I, I, that tonight you did that. I was working the bar, and it was nice because I was at the bar, and I heard the chorus playing, and people were coming and sitting down. And it was yeah. it was very nice ambience. So I I think that for me it works, uh, and because storytelling is about using the imagination, of course, uh, there's no real fixed line. You have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yes, mm -hmm. but you have the involvement of the audience will develop the story, the the pace silences and what may happen and quite often I'll tell stories that I tell a lot and they'll be different it'll be slightly different new things will come up which is very exciting it's great that's, that's, and that's that's great and so 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 that was a nice long intro you you, you talked about the core in yourself so storytelling how, how did you get into storytelling have you always been a storyteller from a young age or did you fall, fall into it later in life so later in life I'm dyslexic which plays a part I've been an artist for 45 years Started sculpting in porcelain, uh, using gold and stuff. Sold, had lots of exhibitions in London, successful. Um, illustrated books. Um, and then a lot of my collectors, so Jim Henson was one. Uh, Elton John's got a piece, those kind of people. Anyway, um, they started asking for stories because I w would send them sketches of a piece that they commissioned and it would have lots of writing on them. Some of it was doodling, but quite a lot of it was writing bits of background stories. So they said, could you tell the stories? Could we actually have a story evening? So I had a story evening. I uh, Lots of collectors came, probably about 80, 100 maybe. Um, and I had learnt three of my stories. And I told my stories. And I thought that was great. But at the end, somebody crept up to me very gently and said, would you like to talk about storytelling? And I kind of knew him. I thought, I he's a storyteller. And so he only lived a village away. A famous storyteller in England, Hugh Lupton. Okay. And over a coffee, a few days later, he was making the coffee, and he, without looking at me, he said, "So, Paul, got a great voice for storytelling, but that wasn't storytelling." And I said, "Sorry." Gave me the coffee and said, "I might be wrong, but I think you were remembering it." And I said, "Yeah, every word I learned it." He said, "That's not storytelling. No. It has to be organic." You do learn the story initially, and then you d begin to reduce it until it's maybe 10 words. And then you begin to regrow it, and when you regrow it, it becomes your story. And when people hear it, it becomes their story. And that's, it is a big wow, because there's a lot of work involved, a lot of walking, you step inside a, a problem area maybe in a story, until it becomes really something beautiful in a way, and then it's not fixed. There is a journey, and oddly enough, the storyteller has secrets at the beginning that he tries to forget, because there are secrets in the story, let's say, like yeah. tonight, um, and that has to be held inside. So all of that's interesting, and you become everything in the story. The protagonist, the trees, the room, the whatever, you are all of it. So I, kn I know the audience will realize uh, when I'm telling stories, when storytellers tell that they, you know, the hills to my right, the the bed is in, in front of me, and it's always there because I can see them there, yeah. and it's living. So it's a living uh, tradition, and it's so fundamental to humanity.
the narrative, our narrative, knowing where we came from, telling it in stories. It's very powerful. Yes, yes, for sure. Tonight, for me, was very powerful because I, I, I like stories. And I, I do this interview channel because I, I get people to tell their stories. Uh, and, and it's nice to, to spread that because um, that everyone has a story. And and like you said, those stories that you tell become people's stories, and and that, who knows? People from tonight might go on and tell those stories in their way, and they'll make it their own, and they'll forget things. They'll forget the, they'll, they'll remember the, the bigger story, yeah. but the minu minutia they'll make up. The important part of stories. So I tell a lot of traditional stories, but they are um, relevant today. What's inside them is relevant: theft, murder, love. Joy, trust. trust, exactly. So all those things are as fundamental now as they were when they first came into that story at some point, maybe 200 years ago, maybe 1,000 years ago. They have, and that's one of the reasons why stories have this thing where there's a storyteller who use, in some way, little description. So it can be set anywhere, and it will give space for the people listening to find their own sense of what they feel about trust or love or misgivings i mean i tell, tell a story about um fear where it's a very short story um where i there's a, a czar uh, the the world is shaking people don't know why it's shaking he's running through a forest he comes to to his palace he asks the czarina what's going on she says go to the window he looks out the window and at the top of the mountain there is a giant the giant has a huge cudgel. He's swinging it around in his he above his head, and he's saying, "Send up your champion! I will fight your champion!" And the Tsar gathers all of his soldiers together, all his brave men, and says, "Who's the champion?" <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and they all look the other way. No, 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 not me. And then he says to Tsarina, "Then I am the Tsar. I have to go. It's my responsibility." So that relates to lots of people. So he then gets his best armor, he gets his best sword, and he leaves the palace, and everybody's watching him, as Arlene's watching him. He's climbing the mountain. He can hear this giant screaming and shouting. He's petrified, but it's his job. And as he climbs up and up, something happens. He looks up, he looks down, he looks up, he climbs higher, and when he gets to the top of the mountain, he looks down. What? And he reaches right down, and he picks up the giant. And his hand, still swinging the cudgel above his head. He says, I don't understand it. How come you're so small? I mean, what's your name? And the giant says, my name is fear. Ah. And he lets fear run away. Very good. Well, look at that. We had a little story tonight yeah. for my little interview. So how long then, you, d you didn't say though, so how long have you been telling these stories? 28 years. 28 years yeah, so I, I because i wanted to do it in this particular way i did it through education in england so about two and a half thousand schools um apparently about a quarter of a million children and about fifty thousand stories wow that's a <laughs> what a great way to end an interview so uh, 28 years and, and lots of children out there yeah. telling stories in that tradition hopefully you know that lives on i spent a lot of time in africa yeah. and uh it's it, it is that that tradition uh, oral I, some yeah, and it, it's it doesn't matter where you come from in the world. So I could tell African stories, I could tell you Inuit stories, and they w we can still relate to them because they are human. The human stories, and in this day and age, we need that more than ever. That human contact, that human understanding that we will have the same loves, joys, and fears, and everything else that goes with it. And that's what this place is about. Yeah, it's making wonderful here. It's wonderful. What an ambience. And, you know, it's just lovely. It's it's a hug in here. <laughs> yes, yes. And that's, you know, or snug, as they would or call snug. an island, you know, yeah, a little yeah. snug. And, and yes, and so thank you very much, Paul, for a lovely night of, of stories. And, uh, you know, the audience loved it. And we'll have passed this interview on to uh, to many people. And then how could people, do you have a website or anything? I, do. I have a website. So it's www.pauljacksonstory.com. Paul Jackson, just C-K-S-O-M. Okay. Very good. There you go, everybody. Joe Diamini, TTRP TV from the uh, back of the ground jet. Once again, thanking everybody, and especially Paul and his lovely Cora. Can you end this interview with a little music?
Thank <laughs> you.